My name is uh, Jonathan Sargent. I'm another Jonathan here. You met Bishop Jonathan earlier. How's everyone travelling so far in the morning? Some of us have been wandering around to other places. Some of us have been camped here. I hope you feel um, wide awake because uh, we're going to do something from another angle on uh, faith and theological education as, is, as, is, as it's expressed here at St Francis College. My name is Jonathan Sargent. I'm fortunate to lecture in some of the practical theology subjects that we have here at the college, uh, Christian education, youth culture and mission, and the subject that's happening next semester is theology and the arts. Uh, maybe it's my favourite subject that I teach here. I like it a lot. It happens at night time so people can uh, come and, uh, and grapple with big issues about how faith and life interact with each other in a subject like that. So uh, we have had the question raised, I think, by all of the mini lectures today, questions to do with where is God? Where does God live? <laughs> where is God? Uh, if you've been, uh, if you identify with the Christian faith, you might just naturally say, well, God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. You know, that's one of the theological ideas that underpins a lot of what we think about Christian faith. And yet in the public space, uh, people seem to have a very different idea about that. The omnipresence of God actually isn't, it isn't any longer an idea that's held by the vast populace. <coughs> what I mean by this is that uh, if we think about religion in the public space, the kind of things that come up that we hear about in the news and in current affairs, things like, you know, former prime ministers uh, worshipping in church who are happy to have their photo taken while they're there, uh, you know, whether cakes can be made for people with all kinds of different relationships and what particular private schools might choose to do with their contracts with students and so on. Uh, there's a whole bunch of issues swirling around just those three photos. We could easily talk about them for 14 weeks. <laughs> but here what I'm trying to get at is the idea that, especially when we look at uh, politics and religion in the public space, you will hear most often, I, I think, I do, people saying... Politics and religion, it shouldn't mix. You know, we should keep those things separate. If you're a politician and you have a particular stance on faith, then you should be able to compartmentalise that away from uh, your your day-to-day -day doing your uh, political work. Now, it's really absurd, isn't it? The idea that you can separate these things out in some way. But in the public space, people tend to be suspicious of a religion particularly people who might not necessarily identify with the Christian faith, or even people who do. Uh, I'm a Christian, and I find that suspicious as well. <laughs> uh, people have been kind of grasping and grappling with this issue about where is God and how, how does faith itself interact with this world that we live in for a long time. Uh, one particular attempt to do this was... Um, popularised by this guy, H. Reinhold Niebuhr. I love this photo because he kind of looks like a Bond villain, you know, like he's about to tell you about his plan to um, destroy the planet. But back in the middle half of the last century, he developed this idea which was published in a book called Christ and Culture. And his idea was that there are five... I'm holding up ten fingers. There are five <laughs> different kind of stances that uh, the church can have with the culture that we're surrounded by. Now, he calls it Christ and culture. Uh, to cut a long story short, he's kind of using the Christ word to stand for the body of Christ. He's talking about the church, that the church can be positioned in different places uh, uh, in a way confronting the world that we live in. Now, we're not going to go into all of those five stances today. We don't have enough time. But basically, all I want you to get at here is that he, he thinks there's five different stances. And uh, at the extreme ends of these uh, is one which says the church should stand totally against culture. The church should um, uh, refute and revile anything that comes from the world. And it's kind of what I think is misinterpreting that Pauline thing about you know being in the world and not of it. I think that actually means something different. But some people have taken that to mean that, well, if you're a Christian person, if you identify with that faith, you should separate yourself from the world and not live in that place. 
So some people like, uh, some, some communities have taken that very seriously and did this pr obviously pr prior to Neva, but you know, like Amish communities and so on who, who would want to separate themselves from the culture they're in. Now, um, that book was incredibly popular and Niebuhr's sort of five stances really captured people's attention in terms of how you could uh, position the church and the world. And for a while, if you think about it, you think, yeah, wow, there's some truth in this idea that there are these five stances, either being totally against the world or being totally in the world and places in between. When you think about it for a little bit longer than just the initial surface, you realise uh, in the 21st century, it really doesn't make sense <laughs> because uh, the church and culture of the world are not separate. They're not two different things that you can sort of say, well, here's this box and here's this box and we'll put them in different relationships with each other. The church is in the world. Uh, uh, the church is part of the world. <laughs> you know, we, I can keep on doing different versions of that sentence, just to say that there is no dichotomy. The church is in the world, and the church is totally affected by the world that's around and shaped by the world and the ideas that swirl around each successive age, if we can compartmentalise ages into successive things. Having said that, what I notice, because I'm interested in how faith and the world, and in particular popular culture, interact with each other, is uh, I often see kind of faith things bubbling up in the popular culture that we consume. And there I'm talking about, you know, TV and movies and uh, 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 popular music and all kinds of things. Faith things bubble up through this. David Tacey, the Australian um, sociologist and writer, talks about the idea that in cultures where faith is kind of suppressed in some ways, well, faith often bubbles up through the arts. Uh, uh, in, in lots of different ways. He has a whole thesis about that. And I see this all the time, particularly because I love movies and going to the movies, uh, in film. And especially in the last 20 years uh, or more, in genres which are very popular these days, like superhero movies uh, uh, and so on. But not only in these areas. You know, the picture that's on the screen there is a, an image some of you might be aware of from uh, what they call Sunday services that Kanye West holds every uh, Sunday in the States that are incredibly popular. Uh, you know, he's a musician, but in the last few years he's kind of been captured by a particular kind of faith and he's holding these services, these religious faith services. If you ever have a chance to Google it and just watch a little bit of one of these, it's amazing stuff. It's incredibly uh, um, charismatic, and I use that in the sense that you know, it draws you in and is exciting. But yes, films. Uh, so what I want to do in the few moments I have left <laughs> is to show you a, a clip from a movie, and I'm going to get you to do a little bit of very quick work. I'm going to show you a clip from the movie Spider-Man 2. It came out a number of years ago now. But as I watch this clip, uh, it, it seems obvious to me that there are faith uh, allegories and ideas buried in what's going on on the screen. So let's watch this clip. When it's finished, we'll uh, talk about what we see. And I'm going to ask you what some of those things you see. Are there echoes from scripture, say, or tradition of the church or whatever that you see in this clip? Let's have a look and we'll see how we go. <coughs> guys not so sure <laughs> <laughs> okay in the, in the moments that we have left maybe I'll just round off a couple of these things uh, uh, it'd be great for us to have a longer conversation about this and it's good that it's one of the things we can do in the actual lectures we do on subjects like this but uh, the giveaway might have been in the title that you have in your uh, um, program for today that we see some of I think Passion Week ideas represented in this clip with this Spider-Man guy that uh, uh, as he attempts to save the people in the train, 
He uses his web and, and saves everyone. I don't really think those tracks would end like that in New York, would they, just in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Probably not. I've never been to New York. Uh, but he saves everyone. And how does he save everyone? He uses his web and he does it in a, a crucifix pose. And we see that crucifix pose used all the time in popular culture to signify, to, to sort of allude to the idea of uh, Jesus on the cross uh, being, you know, murdered by the Romans, uh, and, and in some versions of our Christian faith, doing that as a saving act uh, for everyone. So Spider-Man does that. He saves everyone. And then he's taken down off our symbolic cross at the front of the train. Uh, we don't have a picture in the, in the Gospels of exactly how Jesus was taken off the cross, but I like, anyway, the kind of compassion with which those people gently lower him down and carry him, sort of crowd surf him over their heads. He... Uh, uh, sort of comes to on the ground there. He's resurrected very quickly. It doesn't take him three days. Uh, but he comes to, and um, some small children have found his mask that he actually lost probably kilometres back. But somehow they found the mask and they give it back to him and say, we won't tell anyone. You may have heard of the idea of the messianic secret, you know, the theological idea in the early parts of some of the Gospels where Jesus says to people after he does a miracle, don't tell anyone. Let's just keep it, you know, between you and me about this. And mostly people are hopeless and they just go and tell everyone. Uh, but, you know, Jesus seemed to try to do that in the early Gospels. And maybe we could say that that's out of place in the Passion Week, but that's a thing that seems to happen there. And uh, uh, what else? Other people in the train say, look at him where, before he's come to, oh, he's just a boy. We didn't expect this was the guy who was going to be doing the saving thing for us. You know, like people saying to Jesus, oh, he, isn't he just a carpenter from somewhere? Uh, once he actually comes to, uh, he's still a bit groggy there, and, you know, the antagonist in the film, Doc Ock, comes in, breaks the train apart and says, give him over. And what happens? Well, the people on the train have been sufficiently inspired by Spider-Man's saving work to take on the ministry of, uh, you know, battling evil and, you know, New York pride, standing up to Doc Ock and saying, you know, you want to get through him, you've got to go through me. And one by one, they line up. And am I pulling things too far here to say that you could say this is like the, uh, the disciples becoming apostles and taking on Christ's ministry and furthering it once Jesus himself is uh, uh, not in the picture in the same kind of way. Now, there's a lot of other things to draw out of that clip, and I realise I don't want to take up uh, Peter's time now. The question becomes... Why is that stuff in this Spider-Man film? And there are a whole bunch of reasons that people have suggested for why that might be. Whether it might be just because they're marketing to Christians and want to put Christian ideas in there. Whether it's because the filmmaker themselves might be kind of struggling with faith ideas and trying to work that out. Whether it's because, well, uh, as Christopher Booker said in his book, The Seven Basic Plots, there are only seven stories. And every story is one of those seven stories in a particular way. It's a fascinating idea beyond just that simple uh, premise to get into that. And some people might also say, oh, well, Jonathan, you just see that in that film because you, you're a, a, a Christian person, you're looking for Christian ideas around the place. Uh, whatever position you come to on that, and there are other positions that could keep on going in terms of those arguments, it's fascinating to look into popular culture and see where... Faith ideas bubble up in it. What's going on there? And if people suggest to you, oh, well, you know, uh, God and films and things, that shouldn't mix. You know, God stuff that's not in that grotty film industry. Well, it's bubbling up there all the time. Film and TV and all kinds of popular culture stuff. Uh, God can be found there as well if we have the eyes to uh, detect and discern uh, where God might be there. And in the subject, theology and the arts, that's one of the things we do. We work on a kind of a toolkit to work out how to find those things, how to interpret them, how to think about them, and how to make arguments about what we think about them. Thank you very much for your time today. You know, I get so excited about this, and there's always so much more to say. But thanks for listening to these few ideas. I hope that's been interesting to you. And I'd love to see all of you signing up for Theology and the Arts. <laughs>